Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 111 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. I had such a great discussion with Maria Vasiliou for this episode. Maria is the host of the podcast Filotimo Life, and she lost her mom when she was just two years old. The podcast actually is a discussion about death and related topics, which she started after beginning to study thanatology and deciding that we need to talk a lot more about death in our society these days. We had a really great discussion, some topics we talked about, uh, Maria and her dad moving in with her dad's parents a few years after her mom died, about why she avoided talking about death or about her mom for many years growing up, how hard it was as a child to deal with other, other people's pity and awkwardness when they learned about her mom's death, how much she appreciates that her dad talked with her teachers ahead of each new school year, We talked about using some of the storylines in Disney movies to start conversations with our kids. We talked about her thoughts on the conventional wisdom that kids are resilient, and also about why she decided to study thanatology and to start a podcast about death, and why she believes we need a human-centered approach to grief and bereavement. I hope you enjoy my discussion with Maria Vasiliou. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Widowed Parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Widowed Parent. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Maria Vasiliou. She's joining us today from Toronto, Canada. Maria is a fellow podcaster and the founder of Filotimo Life. She works to drive system change around death literacy and normalize the conversation around death. I invited her here today to speak with us because she lost her mother when she was just two years old. And I'm very glad that she um, was willing to come on and share her experiences with us. So Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You also did a great job with my last name and with the word Filotimo. Very good. Oh, thank you. I tried. I'm, I'm sure I, I butchered it a little bit, but I tried to get it uh, as close as, uh, as I can manage. <laughs> it's all good. Um, okay. So, well, like I said, I, you know, I do think it's such a privilege to be able to speak with people who have this experience that, you know, my, my children and my listeners' children, you know, we are listening because our kids lost their other parent. We lost a spouse. Um, and so to be able to speak with people like yourself who can share some reflections and, and share with us and help us try to understand, you know, the perspective of being someone in your shoes, um, I think is a privilege. So thank you again for um, for coming on here today. I want to hear also about your podcast and your other work. So let's just let's just jump right in here. Um, if you can, please set the stage for us you know, before your mom died. What was your like, how old were you? What was kind of normal before things changed? Yeah, I love going right into the deep end. I'm here for it. So (laughs) before my mom died, I was living at home with my dad and my mom, only child, uh, blessing and a curse, depending on who you ask, and depending Hmm. on when you ask me on any given day. Um, (laughs) And yeah, so before that, honestly, not many, too many memories, Um, but I was was with my parents before she died. Wait, and how old were you then? I was two. Two. Uh Aha. Okay, so very very young, yeah, little baby. Yeah. So, um, so then what happened? How did how did your mom die? So she died from aplastic anemia, and some people say that's kind of like the sister of cancer in a way, hmm. and it can either come about from a certain trigger from the environment or just randomly. And in her case, it was by random, very very chance, like one in a million type of thing. So living with my parents. And again, details are a little bit blurry, but during the time where she was sick for a few months, I was bouncing back and forth between my two sets of grandparents. And following her death a few years later, I actually moved in with my dad's parents and I was very much raised by them, particularly because my grandma was always home. So I very much had that Greek upbringing immigrant story. Uh, Um, Wait, and was your dad, your dad, was your dad, you and your dad were living with his parents then? 
Yeah. So he moved in with his parents and honestly, growing up, it was great because it, my cousins were also around. So it didn't feel like it was an only child. They had that like community and that network. Yeah. And another great thing while I was growing up was when I was in elementary, middle school, and a little bit of high school, my dad actually used to take long vacations during the summer to spend time with me during the mm. summer months, which I mm. very much appreciated. Mm. Did you travel or did you stay local or what did you do? It varied. I remember there, we went through stints of just being like one summer we were obsessed with bike riding and we just rode our bikes all around the city. Um, I remember one time we did, went to Disney World hmm. um, or Disneyland. I can't remember the difference. Um, In California or Florida? Florida, the bigger one. Okay. That's Disney World. Disney World. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So those summers, yeah, they, they were great. And I really appreciate him doing that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's cool. So uh, how long then did you live with your grandparents? When did you move in with them? And how long did that last? I want to say again, blurry with the details, like my old age, man. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to say moved in probably at around when I was five, six years old huh. and then moved out and onto moved out on our own, quote unquote, um, when I was around 13, 14 years old. Okay. Okay. Yeah, That's so a long right stretch. When, yeah. Yeah. Right when high school started. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. Um, so I'm curious what kinds of things I know when, when you were very young, I'm sure you don't remember if I asked you what helped when you were two and your mom died, I'm sure you don't remember, but you know, in the ensuing years, what kinds of things, what did you find particularly challenging or what do what do you think helped with any of those challenges? You know, I had a very interesting conversation um, with someone on my podcast. Her name was, is Mallory McGrath. And we were sharing our experiences when it comes to talking about death. And in that conversation, she kind of made me realize why I really avoided talking about it. And this may not be something that people want to hear or um, will be happy to hear. But growing up, I really avoided the conversation around my mom mm. um, to the point where I would on honestly just lie about it in the sense of if they asked, I would just say, oh, my mom did this, my dad does that. And I would always end with my dad because I noticed people would start to ask questions about him as opposed to my mom. So, and the reason I did this and the reason I bring up Mallory in this conversation is because she kind of made me realize growing up, if I were to talk about it or bring it up, I would be fine bringing it up, but then I would have to deal with the other person's emotions and their reaction and their response yeah. to that discussion. And nine times out of 10, let me tell you, wasn't positive. So <laughs> having to deal with that, especially as a kid, I, I learned very quickly. I didn't want to have to deal with people getting upset. I didn't want to have to deal with um, their sadness. They're mm. almost in some situations, pity eyes. Mm -hmm. I like to call them. Right. Um, and the awkwardness the awkwardness and i again i felt fine i was like oh yeah no mom's dead and their response to that though was like oh my god you poor right. thing right so sad terrible and i would just kind of be like i'm okay like i'm <laughs> i'm good are you good <laughs> right 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 so yeah i get to answer your question it may not be the best response some people want to hear but it, it's the reality of uh what I learned growing up. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't think that's uncommon. You know, I think it's, I think it's tricky. I think it's hard for the child who's in your position. I think it's hard for the other children. I think nobody knows what to say. Right. And I think, yeah. I think it's important that parents hear that this is a thing that, you know, kids might be doing sometimes or all the time. Yeah. Um, and one, one situation that sticks out to me the most is when I was in, I want to say kindergarten and I remember there was a point in time where the teacher was like, all right, kids, we're going to draw. And I was like, oh, heck yeah. Like, we're going to get down to business with this. Yeah. So I remember um, I, I was drawing my family and I drew my dad and me holding hands by our house. There was a dog, there was sun, there was clouds. And in the clouds was my mom with wings. Mm. And I was like, cool, my family, super awesome. Right. And I remember this one child who saw my my painting or my drawing or whatever I did. And he asked, Oh, who's that? And I was like, Oh, that's my mom. And he asked again later on, why is she in the sky? And I responded, mm -hmm. Oh, cause she's dead. And the kid just did not know how to process what I was saying, 
probably never spoke about death in, in the household. Right. Um, pretty sure I'm, I traumatized him to some degree. So I apologize <laughs> if you're listening. Um, but yeah, to your point, kids don't know how to respond if they've never been exposed to that type of dialogue, right? Mm. If they've been exposed to that kind of conversation. Um, and that, that continued honestly, probably up until high school, kids just get very weirded out by it. If they're not used to it. Um, I remember a friend of mine in high school, actually his dad passed away, uh, in the middle of the year, I think it was in grade nine or 10 and no one had known about my mom like growing up. So seeing how kids reacted to his loss and the death of his parent, it just left a very bad taste in my mouth because people were gossiping. People were talking when they shouldn't have been talking. And that Um, experience also for me also kind of validated like, yeah, good call, Maria. Good call, little Maria, not telling people about (laughs) your mom because you don't want to be having to deal with that. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm curious then at some point, did that change? Did you find either that you were more comfortable or your peers were more comfortable? You know, if you did try saying in response to a question, oh yes, my mom died or something. I mean, did, or did that, at what point did that shift if it did? I want to say that shifted over the past few years. So fairly recently, if, mm. if I'm being quite honest. And the reason for it is one, I have surrounded myself with people who are very loving, caring, compassionate, kind, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Two, I've explored this space through my thanatology studies. And for those who are unaware, thanatology is the study of death. I've explored the space. And because of that, I've also been able to access networks of people who are advocates for death literacy, people who are advocating for changes in how we handle bereavement leave, for example. And because of that, I've, I feel as if I've almost stepped into my own in the sense of I've, I've I'm just entering the space and just owning it. And when mm. someone hears that my mom has died or if they hear the work that I'm doing and they get that like off put um, reaction, they're like, oh, well, that's kind of deep. I, I kind of just go, well, you're going to die at some point. So <laughs> might as well just talk about it. Um, and surprisingly, it's there's like a but there's like a light bulb that I see go off sometimes in their mind they're like oh yeah I am gonna die and it's like yeah you're gonna die we're gonna everyone's gonna die let's just talk about it yeah um so yeah yeah well so I'm curious if because I'm thinking about you know parents and how they can help their own children or whatever and I'm wondering if there are some things they could be thinking about that you know might have made it easier for you know for you for example like you know um something your if your teachers had had you know talked about it or your your dad had done something or if you had some skills because of you know some I don't know what or if the other kids had gotten some talking points from someone or you know like are there some ways that could have made this or is it just unavoidable it's just an impossible topic so this is such a fantastic conversation in the context of children and I first want to say in the context of what my dad did. So growing up, he would often speak to my teachers ahead of the school year. Mm. And he would say, Hey, by the way, dead mom over here, like right. mom, M- mother's day um, uh. would often come up. And at that point in time, we would make cards for their, for our moms. Mm. Um, and my dad recognized this. So he would go to the teacher and say, Hey, make it so that it's like for the woman in your life. Mm. It's about the aunts. It's about the grandmas. It's about Mm. the cousins, whatever, X, Y, Z. Sure. So he did that for me growing up, which I really appreciate. And I didn't realize until I, until I was older in life. You Um, didn't know that he was doing it or you didn't realize how important it was. Both. Uh. Honestly. So I I truly think, because I remember also there was one year where the forms that you get as children, they changed the, the heading where it says dear parent to dear parent slash guardian. Mm. I realized that and I was like, oh, very interesting that they made that, <laughs> that shift. Yeah. Um, so maybe my dad changed the world slightly a little bit with that, at least in Toronto, Canada. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So with that regard, I really appreciated that. And in terms of where you mentioned, like, is this something that we have to just deal with? I don't think so. I truly think that if we were to educate kids in a way where they recognize like another person's emotions or understanding that we are mortal, like everyone's life is going to come to an end. 
they don't, there don't, there doesn't have to be these awkward conversations with them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that's hard, you know, is that like, I mean, adults are uncomfortable talking about this and adults don't know what to say or they don't want to say the wrong thing. And if adults have a hard time with it, I mean, kids, they know even less. They're even more uncomfortable generally, I think. Well, it's interesting though, because if you look at the content that children consume, if we, if you look at the content adults consume, um, I believe I was reading an article and said that two thirds of storylines um, on television right now revolve around death, revolve hmm. around someone dying. Um, it's part of the plot line. Hmm. And interestingly, interestingly enough, on my podcast, me and my co-host actually break down an episode called Death in Disney. And there's a lot of death in Disney, let me tell you, folks. Mm. Um, and I look at that and I, I see that as an opportunity to speak with your kid because your children are going to have questions about why did Simba, why did Simba's dad fall off the cliff? Why did Scar do that? What does that mean? Why is he in the sky? Like these are conversation starters that you can can have with your kid to mm. make them have a better understanding and a better grasp of a death being a reality that everyone's going to have to face at some point and also helping them recognize normal and natural reactions to death. Mm. Like what does grief look like for different people? And I truly think opening up that conversation is very much needed and super important. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, f- I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode that you mentioned. You called it what death and Disney, Disney and death. Okay. Death and Disney. Yeah, it's coming out this fall. <laughs> oh, it isn't out yet. Okay. Okay. Um, well, if it's if it's out by the time this comes out, I'll put the link in the show notes. Otherwise, I'd encourage I'll put a link anyway to your show in general and I encourage people to go and take a look, uh, look for that episode. Are there a couple of you mentioned the Lion King? Is there another movie or two that people should think about as a good conversation starter? Little Mermaid, the mm-hmm. death scene with Ursula, very graphic. Not sure if you remember. Very no, graphic. I don't remember. They I remember the songs. Her, they stab her with a boat. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, yeah. Oh. Um, so there's the Little Mermaid. There is Beauty and the Beast. Um, Bambi is another mm. one. Mm. So Hercules. I'm fairly certain most Disney movies at some point death is mentioned. Mm. Um, even with the older ones like Disney. Um, with Tarzan, for example, hmm. um, or even the most recent one, Frozen. Oh yeah, wait, who died in Frozen? I can't. The par- the parents are not uh, okay. mentioned, uh, so it's okay. it's these gotcha. implications, right, that people don't right. really recognize. We're right. we're surrounded by it. No one's talking about it though, but it's everywhere. Right. Okay, see, I haven't seen some of these movies in a while, so some of the details have escaped me. So thank you for. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> Reminding me. Yeah. I think there's the one too with the fish. Uh Nemo. Isn't Nemo's mom fish or dad fish yeah. died? That was a really good movie. Yeah. Yeah. Her his uh his mom. Okay. Gotcha. All right, good. Well, those are some some good potential things for people to check out then. Um and again to to catch your episode breaking this down. Uh good. Okay. Well, um, let's see. You know, one of the things that I like to ask people, um, this conventional wisdom that uh, you know, sometimes people will say kids are resilient, and I'm wondering what your reaction is to that uh, idea. Yeah, I love this question. Part of my thanatology studies involved an entire section looking at kids and grief and bereavement and how they respond to death. Hmm. And when I hear kids are resilient, my my response to that is no kids are very perceptive. Hmm. They're able to see when something's unfair. They're able to understand that they're being treated poorly. And they're also able to recognize when someone else is struggling. They're, they ju- they're just very, very perceptive of situations. Hmm. And when I say they're able to recognize when someone is struggling, growing up, they can see if their family members are struggling with the loss of someone. Mm. They're able to recognize that they lack the language to articulate what they're thinking, but they're feeling something. So oftentimes they don't want to add to the pain or the hurt or the burden of what their family is going through. They want to become the good child. They want to make sure that they're not rocking the boat, that they're doing well in school and they're excelling in sports, X, Y, Z, whatever they want to pick. So 
whenever I hear people say kids are resilient, it's not that it's, it's not that I dislike it. It's just like, oh, kind of reframe how you're looking at it because it's more so kids are taking on that burden in a sense mm. to make sure that the family is good because mm. they, they can recognize when there's stress and again, may not be able to articulate it in terms of what's going on in their brains, but they can sense it and they can feel it and they're responding to it in the way that they know how. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, one of the other things I'm thinking about, sometimes I'd like to ask people who um, lost a parent when they were young and now they've grown up and now maybe they're a parent themselves, um, how that has affected or influenced or changed the way they think about their own parenting. And I correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think at this point you have kids, but do you have some thoughts on, on this topic? Yeah, I'm not a parent, not yet. Don't know if it will happen. If it will happen, we'll see what the universe holds in store for me. Um, but when it comes to raising children, it's, I give this example when a child is freaking out and they throw a toy against a wall more times than not the parent may freak out and say why are you throwing this against the wall what's going on what's wrong with you in that situation i would suggest and i would hope and encourage parents to more so look at the child and say hey how are you feeling why did you throw that against the wall what is happening and it goes again it goes back to the 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 idea that things are happening in a child's mind that mm. they may not be able to identify or recognize or label, and they need to turn to adults to help them do that. Mm. So helping them understand what anger feels like and how anger looks in certain people, what sadness looks like, how sadness feels, what does what does guilt look like, right? All of these emotions that weren't honestly not taught about as kids mm-hmm. and we're just mm-hmm. told to figure out as we as we grow up which i also think is a little bit of a detriment to um all the adults out there because we need to understand how to be human before we can do anything else mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um so speaking of learning and adults and learning about death i'm wondering um if you have any experience with thoughts about having mentors or other, you know, professional, um, you know, therapists, grief counselors, grief camps, um, you know, the, the role of kind of, you know, caring adults in your life, if you have any experience with thoughts on that. Yeah. First off, very much appreciate my dad again for everything that he did growing up for me, um, dealing with that. My grandma as well, really stepped in as like a maternal figure. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to outside the family unit and other outside support systems, um, I would very much encourage people to get a therapist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Makes a world of difference. They're able to help you again, recognize in yourself what you're feeling and also validate what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Um, I recently found out about grief camps. I really wish I found that out as a kid because that sounds super cool and like a lot of fun, which is maybe may weird to say. Um, <laughs> but if, if, if you're a parent and you've lost your partner, I would highly encourage you to speak with your child and ask them if they want to be connected with a therapist or a psychologist or a psychotherapist, whatever the case may be. Because again, just because they seem as if they're well-adjusted and they don't seem like a problem child and they seem like not quote unquote normal, I would, I would reckon that there's something going on. I would still reckon that there's something going on. Yeah. Um, so get them someone to speak to, even if it's just touching base. And I say this as someone who actually from the, from the ages of, I want to say six to 12, I was enrolled in a mentorship program through my school. Hmm. And her name was Eve Simpson. If you're listening, please get in touch with me. I cannot find you. Your name is very generic. Um, (laughs) And growing up, I didn't realize how impactful those experiences were with her. But now that I'm in my mid to late 20s, I'm really recognizing like seeing her once a week during lunch, being able to go on these excursions with her, um, being able to connect and just speak with her was really impactful. And I'm mm. very much grateful for 
being enrolled in that program for as long as I was. Was that someone from the community or was it like a teacher or somebody from the school staff? From my understanding, I've tried to look up this program, but it's been years. So I mm. inter- internet. From my understanding, it was um, social workers mm. that were coming in. And I think any student could enroll in this program. And one of the teachers in one of my previous years actually encouraged my dad to enroll me in it. So he did. And because of that, I was able to, to get a mentor. Mm. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, that sounds like a really neat program. So I'm curious then, um, at some point you became interested in thanatology, which can you tell us again, you said it's a study of death. Can, what, it, what is thanatology? Thanatology is the study of death and how culture impacts our relationship with it. Uh, and the, okay. Yeah, and this course that I'm taking um, looks at how adults cope with death different responses, children, they look at different religions and spiritual contexts in terms of how death is communicated and talked about. It also looks at if you lose a sibling, what does that look like? If you lose a child, what does that look like? If you lose a parent at a certain age, what does that look like and the implications of that? And it also looks at different death responses and the process in terms of coming to terms, quote unquote, uh, with the death of a loved one. So this course, I highly recommend it if you are in the death care space, or if you're interested in learning more about this, I personally think it should be a course that's taught in public school. Uh, because again, death is going to happen to all of us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and so then did, you've started a podcast and it's related to this. Is this, did you get into that before you started the Thanatology program? Is the podcast an outgrowth of that? How did you start getting involved in this podcast? So part of my journey actually from a few years ago when I started to get more comfortable speaking about my mom and her death and everything is I started to look into the space, into the death space. And I stumbled upon something called the Death Cafes. And I thought this was fantastic. Hmm. People just come together and they go to a bookstore, a cafe, whatever you want to pick, have a coffee and talk about death. And the questions that they're given are handed out by the, 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 uh, the volunteers. And some of the questions can be, what song do you want to play at your funeral? How hmm. do you want to be buried? And I had such, such interesting conversations with the people that were there. I went with two friends And I ended up leaving with a bag of cookies by a couple that were there because her ex, her um, deceased partner, um, she had a deceased partner and her current partner was there to support her. They brought cookies for everyone. It was super cute. So I highly recommend people checking that out. So that, that is what started my journey down this path. Those, those death cafes. I think I attended a couple more after that. And then from there, I wanted to start doing my own. You can partner with this organization, host them in in your city if you'd like. Hmm. Then the pandemic happened. As you can imagine, disaster (laughs) um, for millions of people. Over the course of 2020, I recognized that this is work that needs to be done. Like death e-literacy is a huge issue more than 60% of Americans have not communicated their end of life wishes to their loved ones. There, there's a huge gap and no one's talking about this because we're so focused on being hyperproductive and focusing on youth. I see an issue with this. So over the course of 2020, I recognize that this is a huge problem. And that's when I started to do more research in this space. I found the program, I applied got in, I'm taking the courses. And that's when I decided, let's, let's do a podcast. Mm-hmm. I, ho- I did the interviews and I have very supportive friends. Again, thank you, Emma and Stacey, um, who have joined me on this adventure. And we're looking to launch season two at the end of the, at the end of the year. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about the podcast. Like, is it aimed at a particular topic or audience? I mean, besides death, broadly speaking, right? Like what is the, uh, What's the podcast about? So that's an, um, f- that's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking. And the the purpose of Philotima Life is to drive system changes around death literacy. 
And it's to normalize that conversation around death. The way that we do this is transforming the way workplaces, educational institutions, and social policies engage with grief and bereavement. So I can give you an example right now in Canada. If a relative in your family were to die on a Monday, you are given three days um, time paid time off and two days unpaid time off. If you're a full-time employee for three months at an organization. So that's like someone in your family dying on a Monday and you're expected to come into work on a Friday. Hmm. That's not enough time to process what just happened to you, what just happened to your family. That's enough time for maybe you to get everything organized in terms of like the funeral and the burial and everything like that. So changing our understanding of like these policies, they're not made for humans. They're made for machines, like to be blunt. Um, So changing it in a way that it takes a human centered approach to how we handle grief and bereavement as well with workplaces, people are unsure of how to speak with someone that is experiencing a loss or is going through some form of treatment, end of life care, whatever the case may be. So being able to enter these workplaces and being able to train managers and other employees to understand and better articulate themselves when they're communicating with people going through this experience. And then also uh, when it comes to the educational institution element of it, providing education to, again, starting off with children for them to be able to recognize what's happening within their minds, being able to label and identify emotions, I think is paramount to having them have a better understanding of like what's important in life and pursuing what, what they value. Mm, mm-hmm, so this mm-hmm. this to answer your question this podcast tries to encapsulate all of it <laughs> oh yeah 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 terrific well it sounds fascinating it sounds like you guys probably cover a lot of fascinating um topics and aspects of this conversation that um, maybe people don't want to talk about or think about um probably a lot of my listeners unfortunately have had to think about some of these things um but uh you know, there's probably a lot more that you guys are covering. So I'll put a link to it for sure in the, uh, in the show notes to that. So people can check it out. Fantastic. Thank you. We, we also speak with people that are in the death care space. So such as death doulas, um, life cycle celebrants, very interesting job titles. Highly recommend checking it out. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Good. Well, gosh, I think we could keep talking about this all day. I'm, I'm so glad that you've, you've been sharing your perspectives and your journey with us. Um, I do think that it's helpful for, those of us who are parents to hear, you know, from, from someone who, um, who lost their mom in your case, so young at two years old. Right. And I think, you know, experiences are different if you lose someone at two or nine or 19 or whatever, and then how everything um, unfolds from there. So I love to hear a variety of perspectives. So thank you for coming on and, and uh, sharing about that. Let me, uh, let me just ask one wrap-up question, if you don't mind here. Um, if you could say one thing to adults who have a grieving child in their life, what would you say to them? What a wonderful question. And the first thing that came to mind is lead with love. Just mm-hmm. everything that you do, lead with love. Um, and also keep in mind your intentions to keep them safe are important, but also they will have to come to, they will have to face the reality of their situation. So brace them for that. Don't hide it from them. Mm. Lean into the conversation and have it, have that conversation with them. Um, Because if they don't have it with you, they're going to have it with someone else. And it would be better to have that conversation with them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So my guest today is Maria Vasiliu the founder of Philo Timo Life and host of the Philo Timo Life podcast. So Maria, where can listeners find you and find your podcast if they'd like to learn more about your work? You can find us on social media at Philo Timo Life. That's P-H-I-L-O-T-I-M-O-L-I-F-E. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also email us at philotimolife at gmail.com. And you can find us on all your streaming platforms. All right. Terrific. Well, Maria, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Maria Vasiliu as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 111. 
And a great big shout out to all my listeners worldwide this week. As you might imagine, the largest number of listeners is in the United States. After that, uh, it's probably, you could probably guess, that the UK and Canada and Australia have the next largest number of listeners. Welcome and thank you all for listening. Uh, You may be surprised to know that the next three countries after that, actually, and this is listeners in the last uh, 30 days here, Hong Kong, South Africa, and Cyprus have the next most listeners here in the last month. And rounding out the top 10 are Ireland, Slovakia, and Spain. So great big welcome uh, to all of you. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're listening. Please do share the podcast with anyone you know who may be a widowed parent or who might want to better understand the perspective and experiences of the widowed parents in their lives. If you're interested in reading my book, Future Widow, you can get signed copies available at my online store. Go to futurewidowbook.com for all of your buying options. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash widowed parent. Very much appreciate uh, chip-ins for coffees there. I do go to Starbucks and enjoy uh, coffees on behalf of the listeners who have um, so kindly chipped in. So thank you very much. As always, thank you for listening. And until next week, remember, you've got this. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.